It's easy to take for granted that gasoline powers our cars. For most of our lives, gas and diesel were the two choices until the recent rise of battery electrics. But it wasn't always that way. And at the beginning, no one really knew what the best fuel for automobiles was going to be. This is a far too brief history of gasoline. Welcome back to All Cars, y'all. I'm John. At the dawn of the automobile, there was no clear-cut answer what would be the primary fuel source for the next 100 years. After Carl Benz's wife made her historic long-distance trip in 1888 in the patent motor wagon, there was an increasing acceptance of some sort of mineral power. But even by 1900, in the U.S., only one quarter of the cars built were internal combustion, about one quarter were electric, and the remainder were all steam. But those earliest internal combustion cars didn't use gasoline as we know it. Steam locomotion can be traced back to the 17th and 18th centuries, notably to Nicholas Joseph Cunot steam wagon intended to be an artillery tractor in 1779. Development continued around the world, and by the 1900s, the Stanley Brothers in the U.S. and their Stanley Steamer were producing the fastest vehicles available. However, steam vehicles were expensive, heavy, unreliable, and complex to control and operate, and by 1910, just 10 years later, they only sold six to 700 a year when the Model T sold 19,000 in its second year. Electric cars were very early as well, with crude electric carriages in 1832 or 1839, the year is uncertain, and in 1881, a French three-wheel car, in 1884, Thomas Parker's electric car with rechargeable batteries, and the 1888 Flocken Electro Wagon by German inventor Andreas Flocken. While these early EVs were easy to use and quiet, they were hampered by a maximum range of about 20 miles, high cost weight and recharge times, and the internal combustion engine was developed, the electric starter was introduced, and their low cost and quick and cheap refueling led to the effective demise of the EV, at least for the time being. Internal combustion engines can trace their history back even further with one early reference to a gunpowder-powered piston being developed in 1678. Later in the early 1800s, gases like hydrogen were used to power engines, as well as coal gas, natural gas, illuminating gas, and LPG. There were even scattered experimentations with using coal dust as a fuel source. Nicholas Otto patented his working four-stroke engine in 1876, and by the time of Benz's two-stroke patent wagon, it was powered by a liquid fuel source, but again not gasoline as we know it today. Interestingly, that first Benz didn't have a carburetor and a separate fuel tank as we know it today. It had a reservoir with a surface or evaporative carburetor below it with fuel-soaked fibers from where the fumes were drawn into the engine. At the time, there was nothing like a gas station, so for Bertha's trip, she stopped at a pharmacy to buy Ligroin, and that is the location still celebrated today as the first fueling station. The fuel for these early benzes is referred to in many forms in various resources. Hexane, benzene, Lingroin were all mentioned, but they are all light and very volatile and easily obtained. With that first engine making less than one horsepower at 400 RPM, these were slow turning with about a 2.7 compression ratio. By 1900, the automotive world was coalescing around gasoline, such as Ransom Olds switching from steam to gasoline cars, and the Model T being designed as a gas engine. But many of these early engines with their low compression, such as the Model T's 4.0, could use benzene, ethanol, or kerosene as a fuel source. Petroleum, in one form or another, has been used since ancient times. Over 4,000 years ago, there were oil pits near Babylon, a pitch spring on a Greek island, and about 2,000 years ago, the Chinese extracted it and used it as a fuel source. By the year 347, the first bamboo-drilled well in China was producing oil. Persian chemists were distilling oil by the late 800s, and it was available in Western Europe by the 12th century. In the 1800s, wells were being drilled around the world, but in 1859, Edwin Drake's well near Titusville, Pennsylvania is considered the first modern well. 
Many of these wells, including Drake's, were intended to distill the oil for kerosene for lamps. Other products, such as gasoline, were considered an unwanted waste and were disposed of or were burned off to get rid of them. A standard barrel of oil is considered 42 U.S. gallons, and after distillation, you'll get about 19 to 20 gallons of gasoline, with another 11 or 12 gallons being sold as diesel or heating oil. By 1892, with the slow rise of the automobile, the relatively higher energy density of gasoline but the lower vaporization temperature compared to kerosene or diesel, it led to the recognition of gas as a valuable fuel. By the end of the 19th century, Azerbaijan and the Russian Empire was the number one producer of the oil. Then, in 1901, a massive oil strike in Texas at Spindletop dramatically increased the supply of gas and lubricants for the U.S., and with this massive increase in the quantity available, mass consumption of gas as a fuel became feasible. Just how big was this hit at Spindletop? Consider that in 1862, Canada's first oil gusher was only 480 cubic meters a day. When Spindletop was struck, it gushed 16,000 cubic meters a day. Now, early gas could be bought in barrels or in cans at the grocery store, or you could have it delivered to your home. But as gas use exploded, the number of gas stations did as well, rising to 200,000 by 1935, with 15 billion gallons pumped annually by 1930. For comparison, in 2021, the U.S. used 135 billion gallons. Those early years saw increases in the size of vehicles as well as them becoming covered and the increase in weight demanded more horsepower. Larger displacements and more cylinders provided much of it, but gradual increases in compression ratio occurred as well. By the late 20s, the Chevy Stovebolt 6 had a 5.2 to 1 ratio and the Model A's was 4.22 to 1. The limiting factor for increasing the compression ratio and the power was the quality of the gasoline, and at the time they had no way to even measure it, while oils from different fields could yield vastly different mixtures of the hydrocarbons inside. Gas production surpassed kerosene in 1916 after the 1911 development of thermal cracking crude oils, increasing the amount of gas obtained from crude oil relative to kerosene. During the 1910s, other research continued not just on how to measure the anti-knock ability of a fuel, but also what additives to a fuel would help reduce knock. Chemists went to work discovering that mixing other products such as benzene, butane, toluene, and others helped reduce knocking and offset those side effects. All of these combined, and in 1921, a fuel research committee was formed, and by 1928, they developed a standardized test and in 1929, the octane rating scale was adopted. Octane is a hydrocarbon with the chemical formula of CH16 and is a primary component of gasoline as it's volatile and extremely flammable. Those early gasolines had an octane rating of about 40. The octane rating we're familiar with indicates the ability of the fuel to resist engine knock, where the fuel does not ignite evenly, but under compression and heat in the cylinder may ignite in separate areas of the combustion chamber in an uncontrolled manner. It's important to note octane rating does not reflect the power potential of the gas, just its ability to smoothly and controllably burn. Now it's time to introduce Charles Kettering, one of the most amazing engineers of the time and someone who deserves his own video. In 1909, he formed his own company known as Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, or Delco, you may have heard of it. When Henry Leland, the head of Cadillac, and his engineers couldn't develop a practical self-starter, he contracted with Delco and had one by 1911. He set the foundation of the modern electrical system in cars. He invented Freon. And in 1916, he sold his company to United Motors, which then became part of General Motors. But one of the more enduring inventions was improving gasoline. With GM, he hired Thomas Midgley to research additives that could be added to gasoline. And while most failed, there were a couple of exceptions. The first is they discovered adding ethanol helped, but it would be expensive as you needed about 10% ethanol to make a difference. The other was lead, specifically, tetraethyl lead. Based on work started in 1916, by 1921 they had discovered that TEL could reduce engine knock and it was cheap. 
You only needed one part per 1,000 to be effective, and best of all, they could patent it. In 1923, GM, Standard Oil, and DuPont formed Ethyl Corporation to produce this new miracle fuel. It worked as they hoped, and sales took off. Consider that a 1957 Chevy could now have a 10.5 to 1 compression ratio. Although the company said the product was safe, early on the dangers of lead and lead poisoning were known. In fact, Kettering was contacted by MIT, Harvard, Yale, and the University of Potsdam in Germany, warning of its use. By 1924, workers at a refinery in New Jersey producing TEL were suffering from lead poisoning, and Midgley himself had to take time off to go to Florida to recover from lead poisoning. The industry funded studies to prove lead was not a health hazard, and even Midgley held a press conference where he poured TEL over his hands and inhaled it from a bottle for 60 seconds to prove it was safe. Concerned, the Surgeon General temporarily suspended production to investigate, but the panel he convened couldn't find sufficient evidence for short-term effects, but warned long-term exposure could lead to chronic degenerative diseases. Production continued. It was nearly 40 years later in the 1960s that extensive research could prove the effects of low-level lead exposure, including lowered IQ, learning disabilities, and nerve damage. With the formation of the EPA, the phase-out of lead and gas began, and the rise of catalytic converters that would be damaged from lead accelerated it. By 1974, at least one grade of unleaded fuel was required to be available in preparation for the 1975 model year, but it took until 1996 in the United States for leaded fuel to be completely banned for on-road use. Japan banned it all in 1986, and the European Union required cars to use unleaded fuel since 1993. Algeria was the last country to stop selling leaded gas in 2021. Leaded can still be used in aviation fuels. After the removal of lead, multiple other methods of controlling knock have been tried, with additives such as MTBE and BTEX coming and going due to health concerns, others now being used, as well as returning to Kettering's other original option, ethanol. Since pure ethanol has an octane of 100, refiners can actually create lower octane gas, which is then mixed and brings the octane of the gas up to the desired value. Ethanol burns much cleaner than other additives, and as it's based on a renewable resource, serves the dual purpose along with modern engines of controlling, reducing pollutants, and decreasing gas usage. From a waste product to today's highly mixed blends, gasoline has powered most vehicles for a hundred years. But the cleanest gas and the most efficient engines can't eliminate the environmental concerns that many have today. Battery electric vehicles are quickly rising in sales with many countries beginning to mandate them at some point in the future. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are still a niche but out there being researched, so in many ways the current trends in our market replicate those early years of vehicles with multiple fuels all vying to be the next big thing. Of note is the recent push for some synthetic fuels and biodiesels to be accepted for increasing future use as they address a major concern of environmental groups and governments in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It was interesting to find that octane ratings vary across the world. While the U.S. standard is based on the average of two differing tests for octane and our standard grades are 87, 89, and 91, many other countries base their ratings on just one of the tests. For example, in the U.K., regular gas would be 95 with 97 and 99, along with some other more specialized fuels, perhaps reaching 102. In Saudi Arabia, they have 91 and 95 octane, and the fuels are colored green or red to match the color of the pump. Egypt notably has a very few stations that offer 80 octane for very old cars. And that leads me to a question that I was looking up while I was researching this, is why do the British say petrol instead of gas? Well, use of the word petrol became common in the 1800s as a shortened version of petroleum, referring to various mineral oils, and which literally can be understood to mean rock oil. And it was a product name in use from about 1870. British refiners originally used the term motor spirit as a generic term and to distinguish it from aviation gasoline. By the 1930s, when a company was denied a trademark on the term petrol, it spread as the most commonly used term outside North America. 
Interestingly, Motor Spirit had already taken hold, so it is also still in use. For example, in Nigeria, they may use the word petrol, but the nation's laws and regulations use the term Motor Spirit, as do the largest petroleum companies. A better question is why the U.S. uses the term gasoline. The very short version of this is that in 1862, a British coffee merchant sold an oil for lamps called Casoline. Other shopkeepers counterfeited his product in name, and when asked to stop, they changed every C to a G on the labels. And in 1863, the Oxford English Dictionary had an entry for gasoline. By 1864, it was used in North America. Interestingly, other countries and languages don't use either term and instead use terms derived from benzene, such as benzin in German or benzina in Italian. Please forgive my pronunciation. Thanks so much for being here. Please show the channel some love and special thanks to our Patreons. If you'd like to support channels like this and our independent news, opinions, and histories, please consider becoming a supporter. Thanks for being here.